Hi guys. So today I'll be taking a very important topic, the approach to solve the questions which are related to the anisocoria, how to solve the MCQs, and actually what is the protocol that you should follow while solving such questions. Now before I actually go to the flowchart that you should follow, there are certain important things that you should remember at the background. The first important thing is. The pupillary light reflex summates the entire area of the visual field with more emphasis on the central 10 degree. See, we always think that whenever we are studying the pupillary light reflex, light is going inside the eye and that is innervating the pupilloconstrictor fibers to show the reflex. So that means the visual equity plays an important role. Now here there is an important thing. More than the visual equity, it is actually the visual field. The total visual field that is playing an important role. And in that visual field also, it is the central 10 degree. The central 10 degree that plays a major role. So first important thing that you have to keep this in mind that the light reflex, whenever you are talking about the pupillary light reflex, it depends upon the visual field, especially the central 10 degree visual field. Now comes the second important thing. The pupillary light reflex is directly proportional to the working visual field. It is directly dependent on the working visual field and not the visual equity and that is why many a times when you get a RAPD you are getting a defect in the pupillary reflexes while the visual equity is normal this is what happens in RAPD so that is again showing you that is a evidence that it depends upon the working visual field more precisely in comparison to the visual equity then, if you take the examples of the Leber's hereditary optic neuropathy, if I take the example of Leber's hereditary optic neuropathy, if you remember, I had told you five P's. So, in the five P's, one of the P was that the pupillary reactions are normal in cases of the Leber's disease. So, why is it so? Now, let us see in depth. It is because we have the normal pupillary reactions in this disease due to the relative sparing of the damage to the retinal ganglionic cells which are responsible for the pupillary light reflex. Because in the labor's hereditary optic neuropathy, the retinal ganglionic cells which are actually responsible for showing the pupillary light reflex are spared and that is why we get the normal pupillary reactions. All right. Now let's see one more thing and it's very interesting also. Now see what they are saying, they are saying that in one eye we have suppose a small pupil, okay. Now what happens, it may be normal physiological also that one eye is having a smaller pupil in comparison to the other, what is called as physiological anisocoria. And it is said that physiological anisocoria, if I am having physiological anisocoria, then it is normal up to the 0.4. So if you are getting 0.4 or more than 0.4, then it becomes your pathological anisocoria. Physiological can be up to 0.4. So now what is happening? Suppose one is having smaller pupil, another is having larger, right? So this small pupil will allow less light to pass. Okay, less light will go through this pupil, less of the retinal illumination compared to the other eye and therefore there will be RAPD in the eye having smaller pupil. Now try to concentrate on this, RAPD means we have a relative afferent pupillary defect. We know it is the earliest manifestation of the optic nerve disease. It checks for the integrity of the whole visual pathway, impulse going to the optic nerve, then optic chiasma, optic tract and so on. 
Now what they are saying that even a physiological anisocoria, if I am having a physiological anisocoria and the two pupils are differing in size, then also the smaller pupil is giving you a smaller aperture, less of the light is going less retinal illumination and therefore I'll get less response and that even can lead to a RAPD in the eye. Okay. Now, we come to the case of anisocoria. Now, let us quickly revise what is anisocoria. Aniso. Iso means same. Aniso means different. Coria means size of the pupil. So, when we have different size of the pupil, that condition will be called as N isocoria. Now there are two kind of N isocoria. One is the which is actually increasing in the dark. N isocoria means difference in the size of the pupil that difference increases in the dim light or the dark conditions and another is the N isocoria which is increasing under the light conditions. Okay now what is the meaning of in one condition, I am saying that anisocoria is increasing in dark conditions and in other condition, I am saying that it is increasing in the lighted condition. Now, let us try to evaluate this. When there is a dim light, pupil dilates, right? Now, I have a normal pupil and I have an affected pupil. Normal means it will dilate normally. Now, affected eye. Affected eye pupil is not dilating that much or dilating with the leg. So that means there is a problem with the dilatation, right? So that will be increasing the anisocoria in the dark conditions. On the other hand, if I take the anisocoria in the lighted conditions, so that means what is happening due to the light pupil constricts. So here again, normal pupil will constrict. But there is a problem with the constrictor fibers and that means abnormal pupil is not constricting. So here in the lighted conditions, it is the abnormality in the constriction that is showing you an isochoria while under the conditions of the dark, there is a problem with the dilatation. That is a problem with the dilator fibers and that is showing you an isochoria. Okay, now let us first evaluate about the condition where the uh, anisocoria is increasing under the dark conditions. This question, a related question also came in AIMS where they share, uh, said that uh, the dilatation uh, was less and anisocoria was more under the dark conditions, remember? So that was a case of the Horner syndrome. So let us see how to evaluate such conditions. Now, when we are saying that Anisocoria is actually increasing under the dark. We have to think two conditions. Either it can be physiological or it can be a case of the Horner syndrome. Either it's physiological or it is a case of the Horner syndrome. Physiological, as I told you, that, uh, that means that, that it does not have a, any problem but because of the problem with the dilator fibers, physiological. See what happens that reticular activating system, right? That has a innervating, uh, innervation in the EW nucleus. That is your negative influence or the inhibitory influence. So the reticular acti uh, activating system, which is having a inhibitory influence over the EW nucleus may be asymmetrical. So in one eye, it is inhibiting more and in one eye, it is inhibiting less. So that will again lead to an isochoria and that will be your physiological an isochoria, right? Now, another condition can be a Horner syndrome. So how will I come to know that this is a Horner syndrome or it is a physiological? Because we have got certain other criteria also for the Horner syndrome. So let us see what are those criteria. Now, if you see the Horner syndrome, what happens in cases of the Horner syndrome? In the Horner syndrome, we have got oculo sympathetic palsy. We have the palsy of the sympathetic innervation in the eye. So let us try to evaluate that. If you see the eye, suppose this is your upper lid. So this upper lid covers 
टू एम एम ऑफ द कॉर्निया सुपीरियरली वाइल इफ यू सी द इंफीरियर आईलेट दिस इज जस्ट बिलो द लिम्बस ओके सो दिस इज द नॉर्मल सेटिंग द अपर आईलेट कवर्स टू एम एम ऑफ द कॉर्निया सो दिस इज मेंटेन्ड बाय द म्यूलर्स मसल this is maintained by the muller's muscle the upper eyelid is kept at such a pace uh, that it is covering superior 2 mm or roughly 1/6 of the vertical cornea i'm not talking about the lps lps is actually responsible for the elevation of the eyelid here i'm talking about keeping the eyelid here similarly if i talk about the inferior eyelid we have got inferior tarsal muscle now this muscle is again responsible for keeping the lower eyelid at this level and both of them have the sympathetic innervation both of them have the sympathetic innervation now when i am saying that there is a ocular sympathetic paralysis neither this muller's muscle will act and neither this inferior tarsal muscle will act so this upper eyelid will come downward it will be something like this so when it is coming downward what is happening this is actually what is called as a drooping of the upper eyelid so this condition is called as a ptosis so i will also get ptosis in a case of a horner syndrome while the inferior eyelid which has to be kept here will not be kept here and it will be overriding so this is also going up this will be called as inverse ptosis this condition is called as the inverse ptosis so i have ptosis i have inverse ptosis then i also have the enhydrosis enhydrosis especially in the face so we have the facial enhydrosis and a very very important thing that i have to you have to be very very careful and uh, so that it becomes prominent i'm using a different color i have a smaller size pupil this is called as meiosis this is called as the meiosis now my concentration at this time is on the meiosis though i require though i require other symptoms also so what i am saying that if the anisocoria is increasing in the dark i will have to see whether i have this ptosis inverse ptosis meiosis then facial anhydrosis loss of cilio spinal reflexes then i am saying that this patient is having the horner syndrome now try to understand why i have meiosis here because of the failure of the dilatation here we have failure of dilatation of the pupil that is why i am having meiosis why because dilator of the pupil is the dilator pupilli muscle dilator pupilli and dilator pupilli muscle is also having the sympathetic supply so that is why i because i have the uh, paralysis of the sympathetic innervation that is why pupil is not dilating and i have the the meiosis now if you go back to this chart this becomes very very interesting i am saying that this should have been meiosis but why it is then increasing why it is increasing in the dark now try to understand whenever we have dark whenever we have dark pupil dilates everybody know this but why does this pupil dilate pupil dilate due to two reasons in the dark two reasons one is the sphincter sphincter pupilli relaxation here it is not constricting it is relaxing and second is the dilator pupilli contraction so basically it is the summative effect of both in the dark conditions we all we have the relaxation of the sphincter and we have the contraction of this dilator pupilli and therefore totally we have the dilatation of the pupil now what will happen in a person who is having horner syndrome we have just the 
relaxation of the sphincter pupillae but i don't have this contraction of the dilator pupillae so what will happen well I, when this person will go into the dark in the normal eye there will be relaxation also and there will be contraction of the dilator pupillae also but in the uh, eye which is having this horner syndrome we will have the relaxation of the sphincter but i will not have the contraction of the dilator pupil so what will happen there will be difference in the size of the pupil and an isochoria will increase so this is a very very important thing then second important thing is the principle of the dilatation leg dilatation leg what do you mean by dilatation leg which is found in the horner syndrome now when we go in the dark initially there is just the relaxation of the sphincter there is no contraction of the dilator pupillae and this is actually maximum this is maximum after 4 to 5 seconds so you are seeing this anisochoria which is maximum after 4 to 5 seconds in the horner syndrome as soon as the person goes into the dark and slowly and gradually when it reaches to about 10 to 20 seconds it is actually as reassumed okay so there is a dilatation that you get so there is a decreased innervation by the um, sympathetic supply to the dilator pupillae muscle so though we are not getting any innervation at 4 to 5 seconds and therefore we have maximum anisochoria there it is now obtained at 10 to 20 seconds and there will be reversal of this anisochoria that is why this is called as dilatation leg we are getting the dilatation but at a later time therefore it is a leg so we are getting a dilatation leg also we are getting a ptosis we are getting the facial and hydrosis therefore we are sure that this is a case of horner syndrome up till here only we got a question in the aims 2020 now let us see the further parts now once you know that it is a case of the horner syndrome how can i confirm the diagnosis i can confirm the diagnosis by giving 4% cocaine or by giving 0.5% apraclonidine or by giving 0.5% apraclonidine now both of them can be used for the diagnosis but usually we prefer the 5% apraclonidine because there are two advantages first of all cocaine you know is a uh, abuse substance and therefore we have got a control in the availability so this 5% apraclonidine is not a control substance it is easily available first of all and secondly it is showing a positive effect on the affected eye positive means it is showing the dilatation effect in the affected eye the eye which is having the horner syndrome so if i give this 5% apraclonidine the dilatation will be present if the eye is having this horner syndrome so this is called as a positive effect while in cases of cocaine first of all it is a abusive substance so there is a problem of availability we don't want to give it and also it has a negative effect that will show a positive effect in cases of the normal eye that is why we prefer the 5% apraclonidine but if there is a side effect or there is some uh, known allergic reaction then we will go for the cocaine okay so once you are getting the dilatation the diagnosis is confirmed and we know it is a horner syndrome now the next important step is to confirm whether it is preganglionic or it is postganglionic this again remains a important step now next question is why it is so important to find out whether this horner syndrome is a preganglionic one or a postganglionic one because many a times when you are sure that this is preganglionic or this is postganglionic it becomes very very easy for you to order the or request the imaging site because many a times the cause of the horner syndrome can be a stroke it can be a malignancy a vascular headache or it can be um, aneurysm it can be a carotid uh, pathology it can be a cavernous sinus pathology so we require 
have the exact cause and for that we require imaging and for that I should know whether it's a pre-ganglionic lesion or it's a post-ganglionic lesion. So for this I'm using 1% amphetamine. So if it is showing the dilatation that means it's a pre-ganglionic lesion and if it is not showing the dilatation it is the post ganglionic so remember no post means no dilatation in the post ganglionic no post so this was about your Horner syndrome now come to the other side of the story if i am saying that the problem is lying in the light and this anisocoria is increasing into the lighted condition so that means my affected eye is not able to constrict properly not able to constrict properly so maybe a problem with the sphincter of the iris or maybe a problem with the constrictor fibers which are parasympathetic fibers or, and that is innervated by the third nerve so i will have to look then so first of all check the ocular motility because if the third nerve is affected we know that most of the extraocular muscles are supplied by the third nerve except for LR6 and SO4 so if the third nerve palsy is there I will have a problem with the ocular motility also so if it is abnormal I have a very clear cut case that this is a third nerve palsy and then I can check the other signs of third nerve palsy like I should be down and out then the uh, limited actions uh, will be there and the actions which will be possible will be of only superior oblique and the lateral rectus so we can check the other things also but if the motility is normal then what will we doing we will actually give the pilocarpine then give the pilocarpine 0.1 to 5 percent and we know that the ad's tonic pupil will actually constrict okay so if you are getting the constriction again your diagnosis is clear it is the ad's tonic pupil and you are done but what if it is not showing the constriction then you have to go ahead with the one percent pilocarpine now check with the one percent pilocarpine what if the constriction happens if it is constricting now then you are sure that it is a third nerve palsy then also it's a third nerve palsy and even if by the 1% pilocarpine it is not showing the constriction then your answer is pharmacological midrasses some midriatics have been given to the patient so if you see the question here the question that i gave you was in a case of n isochoria when 1% pilocarpine is instilled into the eye so they are coming directly here 1% pilocarpine is instilled in the eye no response so you are not getting any response even with the 1% pilocarpine so even without looking here I know the answer is pharmacological midrasses and here comes the answer C so it is actually the pharmacological midrasses because if you have already given the dilators all the innovations will be blocked and the patient will not be showing any of the response either by the um, accommodation or the pupillary uh, light reflex or even the one person pilo carpine so i hope this is now very very clear to you and any questions which will be formed on this and isochoria will be easily dealt with it if you like this video please like share and subscribe and do let me know in the comment section that what other other videos and the other topics that you want me to make videos in uh, also also try to uh, revise this flowchart again because I am sure that a lot of questions will be formed on this. 